The winter's chill had cast a frozen spell over the landscape, turning the world into a pristine wonderland. Mike, Emily, and Alex, a tight-knit group of friends, trudged through the snow-covered path that led deeper into the dense forest. Their breaths hung in the frigid air as they made their way toward the old Ashton estate, a mysterious cabin in the mountains with a dark family history that had long been rumored to be haunted. Mike, a young man with a thirst for adventure, led the way. He couldn't help but feel a surge of excitement as they approached the cabin. Can you believe we're actually doing this? Spending the night in the Ashton house? You know legend says the Ashton family mysteriously vanished many years ago, and no one has ever seen them since. Alex, less eager than Mike, followed behind him as he replied. Well, I guess it's better than being at home. Emily, who had always been intrigued by stories of the supernatural, walked beside them. Her curiosity peaked. I've heard so many tales about this place. They say it's haunted by the ghost of the Ashton family. As they drew closer to the cabin, a sense of foreboding settled over them. The trees loomed like silent sentinels, their branches heavy with snow, casting long shadows on the path. The Ashton estate itself, barely visible through the trees, stood like a relic of another era. The cabin came into full view, an imposing sight amidst the desolation of the winter landscape. Its once charming exterior now seemed grotesque in the fading light. The gray weathered wood appeared to have absorbed the melancholy of its surroundings, creating an aura of profound abandonment. They approached the front porch, but even getting close sent shivers down their spines. The porch creaked ominously under their weight, as if protesting their intrusion into his gloomy realm. Broken, jagged glass clung to the window frames like frozen tears, making it seem as if the cabin itself had wept in solitude for years. Emily hesitated at the threshold, her fingers trembling as she gripped the rusty doorknob. She turned it slowly, and with a slow, groaning protest, the door creaked open. The air inside was thick with dust and a musty odor, as though the very essence of time had been captured within its walls. Their footsteps echoed on the wooden floor as they cautiously entered the cabin. The feeble light of their flashlights revealed a scene frozen in time. Furniture veiled in tattered, moth-eaten sheets stood as mute guardians of the days long gone by. Faded photographs, their subjects long forgotten, lined the walls. The grand fireplace in the room was constructed of a dark stack stone, and its heavy wooden rafters creaked as the wind contested the house from its exterior. As they stood there, they swore they could hear a mournful whisper that seemed to emanate from somewhere down the cabin's dark halls, and the sensation of being watched settled upon them. Did you hear that? Emily exclaimed. Mike swallowed hard, his voice trembling as he replied. Um, maybe it's just the wind? This place is creepier than I imagined. Alex, with a nervous laugh, tried to break the tension. Come on, guys. We're just letting our imaginations run wild. Let's explore a bit more before we start jumping at shadows. They pressed on, their flashlights cutting through the gloom, but the feeling of isolation and abandonment persisted. Little did they know, the true horrors of the Ashton estate were yet to reveal themselves. Alex set about preparing a fire in the room's large fireplace, while Emily and Mike sat there on the floor watching him. Look at you, our wilderness expert in action, Emily commented. Mike chimed in with a sly grin. <laughs> yeah, Alex, our survival guru. Letting out a small chuckle, Alex shook his head and continued to carefully arrange the tinder pile before lighting it. In no time at all, Alex had the fire casting a warm, comforting glow across the room. Emily burst into laughter. All right, Mike, what's on the menu tonight? I hope you brought something gourmet in that backpack of yours. Mike, with a childlike grin, opened his pack and slowly pulled out a single protein bar, presenting it to both Alex and Emily, as though he were a waiter at a fine dining establishment. Emily couldn't help but burst into even louder laughter, covering her face with her hands. She peeked at Alex slightly hoping he had something more substantial to satisfy their appetites. Well, Alex? With a confident smile, Alex began unzipping his backpack's main compartment, 
Reaching in with both hands, they retrieved a large can of chicken noodle soup and a compact portable kerosene cooktop, just big enough to hold a small cast iron skillet. Emily smiled and raised her eyebrows as she redirected her glance towards Mike. <laughs> he is the guru, Mike laughed. Alex lit the cooktop and began heating the soup. Hey Mike, you remember when you tried cooking popcorn that one time when we were kids? Alex questioned. You mean the time I almost caught the house on fire and then had to discharge that old dry powder extinguisher all over my mom's kitchen? Yep, replied Alex. That was the biggest mess we've ever made. <laughs> we? exclaimed Alex. Okay, it was me alone. Mike laughed as he leaned over against Emily, who sat next to him on the floor. The three of them huddled together, relishing their warm soup by the fire. As all three of them finished their meal, they reluctantly tore themselves away from the fireplace, preparing to venture deeper into the dimly lit cabin. Dusty bookshelves lined the walls, along with outdated floral decor. They made their way down a long hallway flanked by bedroom doors. The bedrooms appeared to be in a state that indicated the previous occupants had left hastily. At the very end of the long hall, they stumbled upon a family portrait showcasing three individuals. A solemn-looking older couple with piercing eyes and a young girl. The young girl had a faint, innocent smile that seemed frail and sickly. She couldn't have been no more than four years old at the time the picture was taken. This must be the Ashton family. Look at those eyes. There's something off about them, said Alex. And look at the girl. She looks so innocent in comparison to her parents, exclaimed Emily. They turned away from the picture and shifted their attention to the grand staircase beside them. Mike glanced back at Emily and Alex, silently seeking reassurance that it was safe to continue. A nod from the pair is all he needed as they began their ascent. At the top of the staircase, a massive wooden door awaited them. As they entered through the door, darkness enveloped them, but the faint echoes of their footsteps indicated that the room was vast and open. Their flashlights swept across the expanse of room, occasionally catching the reflection of a towering object on the opposite end. As they slowly walked toward it, the massive object revealed itself to be an enormous mirror. Look at this mirror. It's huge. Emily whispered in awe. The three of them stared at their distorted reflections, when suddenly, a shadowy figure appeared to emerge from behind them. Did you see that? There was someone behind us, shouted Emily. With their backs pressed up against the mirror, they scanned their flashlights to reveal nothing but more empty dark voids of the attic they were in. It must be a trick of the light. Let's just get out of here. Mike's voice quivered with unease as he suggested leaving the cabin. The unsettling atmosphere was getting to him. As he turned to go, shuffling his feet along the dark wooden floor, the toe of his boot collided with a dense object and he fell to the ground. With a groan, Mike glanced around and saw a large book lying on the floor. From his kneeling position, he reached over and grabbed it. The book was cold in his grasp, bearing the scars of time. A numbing sensation shot through Mike's arm as he struggled to hold on, too infatuated to set it down. Guys, look at this, he whispered, his voice quaking with fear and fascination. We should take this. Emily and Alex exchanged a wary, silent glance, their unease palpable. They knew that taking something from a place with such a sinister reputation was reckless, and their instincts told them to leave it behind. Emily mouthed a silent warning to Alex, her eyes wide with apprehension. Alex cleared his throat, his voice hesitant as he spoke. Mike, are you sure about this? It doesn't feel right. Emily added, her voice trembling slightly. Yeah, it's like we're toying with something we shouldn't. But Mike couldn't tear his gaze away from the book. It was as if an invisible hand had beckoned him, drawing him inexorably closer. A sudden loud knock erupted from a dark corner. Mike's grip on the book faltered, and it fell from his hands, crashing onto the floor with a foreboding thud. In a reflexive moment of terror, Mike hurled his flashlight towards the source of the sound, its beam slicing through the darkness. Filling the chill in the room intensifying, 
Emily moved towards Mike and gently tugged on his jacket. Mike, I'm cold. Please, I want to leave. This is too much. Mike's gaze shifted from the room's darkness to the ground where he had dropped the book. Beside it lay a single page that seemed to have torn away from the book's binding during the fall, setting this solitary sheet free. Curiosity and dread intertwined as he knelt down once more, balancing his flashlight, the book, and the detached page in his trembling hands. His flashlight's beam revealed the words, Ritus Finalis, written on top of the page. As he strained to decipher its meaning, another ominous knock echoed in the distance, jolting the trio with fear. In unspoken agreement, they retreated to the room's door in which they had originally entered through. Mike crumbled a single sheet and hastily slipped it into his pocket as they moved through the darkness, still clutching the book tightly in his arm. Together they made their way out of the room, their footsteps echoing loudly as they descended the stairs. They walked in silence, each of them secretly grappling with the realization that what was supposed to be a fun-filled night was slowly transforming into a horrifying nightmare. The fireplace crackled and spat embers into the air, casting a warm dancing glow that pushed back the encroaching darkness of the old cabin's living room. The trio sat there in silence on the threadbare rug that lay before the hearth. Mike took the book and opened it once more as he thumbed his finger to the first page. Whoa, guys, take a look at this. Mike roared with excitement, his voice echoing through the dimly lit room as he read aloud from the ominous page. I, Sarah Ashton, do solemnly swear to relinquish my soul over to thee in exchange for my daughter's proclamation from her sickness. Use me as a medium and give me the knowledge and ability to cure her. At the bottom of the page, as if finger painted in dark red blood, was the name Sarah Ashton. The three of them sat there in silence for a moment, the weight of the revelation sinking in. Guys, this isn't a diary, Mike paused, his fingers trembling as he began to rapidly flip through the book, glancing at various pages. This book is a guide on how to perform a ritual. It's as if the first page is a contract, an agreement. I mean, it's weird, because the writing style in the rest of the book is totally different than the first page. Emily, growing increasingly uneasy, leaned in closer to Alex and gestured him discreetly for him to intervene, hoping to persuade Mike to put the book down. Alex nodded in agreement, understanding her concern, but when he tried to gently interject, a subtle annoyance ignited within Mike, and he shot Alex a quick sideways glance before continuing to read. Seeing Mike's negative reaction, Emily decided to back up Alex's request and spoke out. Mike, please don't be rude to Alex, she implored, her voice trembling slightly. I'm just getting uncomfortable and… Before Emily could finish her sentence, an audible, sharp, otherworldly whisper pierced the air. Join us. Did you hear that? Someone else is here, Emily cried out. We need to get out of here now, Alex yelled as he picked up his hiking pack and retrieved his hatchet. But the whispers replied. Stay. With adrenaline pumping, they hastily made their way towards the door, leaving the unsettling secrets of the Ashton house behind. The three of them found themselves bathed in the soft glow of the moonlight, gasping for breath, but relieved to have escaped the haunting clutches of the old cabin. What the hell was that? Emily cried out as she grabbed hold of Alex's arm, hoping to find an ounce of comfort. What are we going to do? It's dark and we're miles away from our car. We'll be fine, Alex said in a reassuring tone as he wrapped his arm around Emily. The group of friends found themselves standing on the edge of a desolate, moonlit forest that stretched out before them like an endless sea of shadows. The towering trees with their gnarled branches reaching for the heavens seemed to stand guard in stoic silence. Moonlight filtered through the dense canopy casting eerie shifting patterns on the forest floor, but the overall atmosphere felt far less threatening than the house that they had just fled. They began walking down the dark trail, as the house's single lit window from the glow of the fireplace slowly vanished behind the trees. An eerie hush enveloped them, and no one uttered a word. 
The only sounds that filled the night were the soft crunch of their footsteps on the snow and the occasional snap of a tree branch in the darkness. Yet amid this silence, a relentless stream of questions plagued their thoughts. What was that voice we heard in the house? Who did it belong to? And the most haunting of all, were they being followed by them now? As the night wore on and a few hours slipped by, the group's oppressive silence was finally broken by Mike. He spoke with a sigh of relief, his voice lightening the heavy atmosphere. Whew, I'm glad all that's behind us now, he chuckled, trying to inject a sense of normalcy into their nightmarish experience. The others readily agreed, the tension in their shoulders easing as they exchanged nervous laughter. Huh, yeah, Alex exclaimed, his humor tinged with a hint of sarcasm. If it weren't for Mike and his book, I'd say tonight's stay in that house would have actually been pleasant. Emily joined in, her tone dripping with exaggerated nostalgia. It's such a shame. I'll genuinely miss the enchanting aroma of old musty furniture. You know it's bad when I consider sleeping on that cold hardwood floor before sitting on anything else in there. Ha! <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Alex chimed in. You know, Mike, I'm genuinely sorry that you left your book at the house. But don't worry, buddy. We'll get you a new one for your birthday next month. Alex roared with sarcastic laughter, the tension dissipating with each chuckle. Yeah, and the one we get you won't try to kill you either, said Emily, as she playfully nudged her elbow into Mike's ribcage, expecting a playful response. However, Mike responded with a strange silence, turning his head away from them, as if trying to avoid the topic altogether. The humor was replaced by an unsettling pause, as a sense of unease settled over the group once more. It was then that both Emily and Alex exchanged a knowing glance, their suspicions growing stronger. Without warning, Emily and Alex abruptly halted in their tracks, their expressions filled with dread. Mike, seemingly oblivious, continued forward. Emily and Alex turned toward each other, exchanging a worried glance, silently acknowledging that they shared the suspicion that Mike might still have the book. Mike? Questioned Emily. Mike slowed his progression forward and came to a complete stop, his gaze scanning the dark trail ahead, his intentions unclear. Emily couldn't hold back any longer. Mike, you did leave the book there, didn't you? Her words held a mix of fear and accusation. Mike hesitated for a second, his silence an unsettling response. Slowly, he turned around, his fingers wrapped tightly around the ominous leather-bound book. Emily winced in fear, her apprehension deepening, while Alex's clenched fist and determined stride in Mike's direction conveyed his anger and frustration. Mike, are you out of your damn mind? You actually brought that thing with us? Alex yelled as he squared up to Mike. Get rid of it now! Mike assumed a defensive stance as he clutched the book to his chest. His voice was low and menacing. You think I'd just toss it away like that? You don't understand anything! Mike's posture was threatening, a silent promise that he wouldn't part with the book so easily. Emily cried out as she placed herself between the two men, her outstretched arms creating a physical barrier. Guys, stop! This isn't helping! We're all scared, and fighting won't solve anything! Alex, though still seething, reluctantly backed down, his fist slowly unclenching. Mike too eased his defensive posture, though the book remained firmly in his grip. With a heavy sigh, Emily continued. Let's find a place to set up camp. We can talk about this tomorrow morning when we're not on edge. Her voice carried a soothing undertone, a plea for unity and the face of the unknown. After a while, they stumbled upon a small clearing gently illuminated by the moon's soft glow. Once the campsite was established, Alex and Emily huddled close to the crackling campfire, their faces bathed in its warmth and flickering light, their unspoken concerns hanging heavily in the air as they watched their friend Mike sitting alone in the shadows, his attention fixed on the book. Emily leaned in closer to Alex. Her voice was soft and her words laced with unease. Alex, did you notice how defensive Mike got when you tried to take the book? Alex nodded, his gaze never leaving Mike. Yeah, it was strange. I don't understand why he's so protective of that thing. Do we have a plan then? To get to the bottom of this? Emily questioned. Alex nodded thoughtfully, 
his eyes never leaving Mike's distant figure. Tomorrow when the sun's up, we'll talk to him. The two of them sat there in silence as they watched their friend hold the book and continue to read. As the hours passed, they each gradually retreated to their respective sleeping bags, and the campfire's last embers glowed briefly, then surrendered to the night. The air was heavy with the familiar noxious scent of damp, musty linen, intermingled with the ever-present dust. Emily's head throbbed relentlessly. The pulsating ache that centered in her temples seemed to echo the thready rhythm of her heart. She went to rub her forehead in hopes of easing the mounting pressure, only to stop short as she realized that both her wrists were firmly bound together with sections of age weather rope. Her knees hurt as they shuffled around on the dirty, cold wooden floor. The sharp sounds of ethereal whispers surrounded her. Panic surged within Emily as she struggled to gain her bearings, but her surroundings swirled in a disorienting haze. Desperation clawed at her as she fought to make sense of the dizzying blur that engulfed her. To her left, a man's groans echoed through the eerie stillness. Who is that? Emily cried out, but the only reply she received was the man's groan once more. This time more clear and recognizable. Alex? A weary, almost defeated reply came from Alex. Em Emily? As the room slowly came into focus, her heart dropped when she realized that both she and Alex were seated in the heart of the attic of the old Ashton mansion. There beside them stood two lines of ominous figures cloaked in crimson. Emily's gaze shifted to Alex, confirming that he too was ensnared in the relentless grip of the malevolent ropes. Emily's eyes darted downward to her restraints, her terror palpable as she whimpered, each breath a tremulous, fear-laden quiver. She fought with every fiber of her being to break free, her frantic efforts a testament to her desperation. But the unforgiving ropes held her in a vice-like grip, mocking her futile resistance. Amidst the darkness, a ghostly whisper erupted, a shrill and eerie screech that reverberated the room. Finish this, Mike. And stay here forever. Her gaze lifted to find Mike's looming figure casting an ominous shadow over her. In his left hand, he cradled the cursed book. In his right, a golden dagger. Neither Emily nor Alex's cries for salvation reached Mike's ears as he remained chillingly unresponsive, his eyes vacant and devoid of humanity. An eerie, incomprehensible chant escaped his lips each syllable laden with a sinister weight. As his eyes locked onto Alex's, Mike's lips twisted into a malevolent smile as he began shouting the chant for everyone to hear. While Alex was crying out, begging Mike to stop, Emily strained to free herself from the bondage. With every twist and turn of her wrist, small amounts of blood began to cascade down her hands to the floor. Soon the entire section of cordage was a dark ruby red. Still continuing to struggle, she violently whipped her head back to look up at Mike as she let out a blood-hurdling scream. Mike stopped chanting, turned and made eye contact with her, and then thrusted the dagger deep into Alex's torso. The room went dark as Alex's screams faded away. The gentle rustle of leaves in the breeze and the distant calls of birds composed a tranquil woodland melody. Inside the tent, the soft, diffused morning light seeped through the fabric, casting a warm glow on the crumpled sleeping bags and scattered gear. As the remnants of Emily's pounding headache from the nightmare began to gradually subside, she found herself slowly emerging from the shock of the night. She cautiously turned her attention to Alex's sleeping bag on the opposite side of the tent. As he laid there, his eyes carried a blank yet deeply troubled expression. Drops of sweat slowly trickled down his pale face. Beneath his fatigued eyes, pronounced bags had taken residence, making it seem as if he had never even fallen asleep. Emily remained in hushed contemplation, her thoughts lingering in the wake of the haunting dream. Intending to check the time, she slowly turned her attention to her phone, yet as her gaze shifted downward, she was met with a sudden and unsettling sight. Wrapped around her wrist, were faint but distinctly irritated red marks. Emily concealed her wrist with a swift tug of her sleeves, 
A sudden jolt of anxiety shot through her as she sat up quickly and glanced over to Mike's sleeping bag. Alex mirrored her actions, pushing his sleeves down over his wrist. His own concerns kept hidden as well. Where's Mike? asked Emily. Mm, I don't know. How did you sleep? Fine, Alex quivered. It was clear to Emily, though, that Alex's rest was far from fine. Alex rolled his eyes and began packing his belongings, preparing for the day's long hike back to the car. Emily, in need of fresh air, got up and exited the tent. She spotted Mike sitting alone by the fire, the book resting close beside him. She hesitantly greeted him. Good morning. Hey, Mike replied curtly. How did you sleep? Emily asked, trying to break the awkward silence. Fine, Mike responded tersely, his tone still carrying a lingering hint of resentment from the previous night. Observing Mike's distant and troubled demeanor, Emily couldn't contain her frustration. She crossed her arms and pursed her lips as she sat down next to the book on the opposite side from Mike. His hands instinctively moved to protect it, which only deepened her concern. With a groan, Emily finally spoke her mind. Mike, what's going on with you? She questioned, her voice filled with genuine worry. You've always been someone I could turn to in life if I had a problem, and now it's like I hardly know you. Mike let out a weary sigh as he gazed into the distance, until slowly he turned to look at Emily. Emily, something's off. It's like I'm walking around in a fog. I just... I don't know. What, Mike? Emily replied. You don't know what? I don't know why you and Alex hate this book so much. The fact that y'all wanted me to leave it there last night? Why can't y'all see there's so much more to this than just pages and ink? Why? Emily flinched as Mike yelled, still too in shock to reply. Alex stepped out of the tent and glanced in their direction, watching closely to see what Mike would do next. After pausing a moment, Alex turned and began disassembling the tent. Emily reached over and placed her soft hand on Mike's shoulder, giving him a reassuring pat. Mike, I'd really like to learn more about this book with you, but let's not do this alone. Mike sat there in silence with his eyes fixed on Emily. Last night when I was laying in bed, I found the contact info of a lady in town. She's an expert on haunted and otherworldly items. She paused and took a deep breath, trying to gather the correct words to come off as if she truly cared about the book. Her name's Rebecca Simmons, and she's a paranormal researcher. One of the best, as a matter of fact. She's been practicing for several years. Longer than we've both even been alive, Emily awkwardly giggled. We would be doing the spoken injustice if we alone tried to understand its true powers. Don't you agree? They sat there in silence. Mike cautiously looked down at the book he now cradled in his arms. Mike, what do you think? Maybe she's right. Mike whispered to himself. Emily glanced over to Alex who was now standing still, watching the whole conversation unfold. Maybe she's right, Mike repeated again, speaking as if someone else was there with them. Yeah, let's do that, Mike said with a weak and motionless tone. Alex, Emily, and Mike spent several hours of the morning hiking the path back to their vehicle. No one spoke a word the entire walk back. Upon arriving to the car, the three of them quickly loaded up their gear and got inside. Alex drove while Emily rode in the front passenger seat, and Mike sat alone in the back seat still holding onto the book. The tall bare trees and icy mountains slowly faded away in the rearview mirror. Emily helped guide Alex with directions as they drove back to the quaint town of Pineville. Like many old towns, Pineville was once booming with business back in the 1950s, but those prosperous years were a thing of the past. Leaving behind dilapidated buildings, crumbling sidewalks, and abandoned storefronts. Throughout the years, several businesses had attempted to open and occupy these spaces, but they inevitably floundered. Pineville lacked both the population and charm needed to sustain them. Other than the nearby mountains that attracted skiers during a select few weeks in the winter, Pineville didn't offer much else. 
Rebecca Simmons' office was located on a small side street in the middle of town. Its brick exterior crumbled and broken in various places. Above the front entrance to the office, the name Simmons was displayed on a wooden sign. Emily looked at Mike and gave him a half smile. You excited? Mike stared forward at the office and didn't say a word. Well, where did I put it now? Rebecca questioned. Rebecca was notorious for misplacing her coffee cups. Of course, it was no shock. Due to all the piles of books, scrolls, and boxes that littered her large open concept office. This will be your second cup to misplace this morning. She chuckled as she began to pour another cup of coffee for the third time. She lifted the fresh cup of steamy coffee up to her nose as she took an admiring sniff. Her attention was taken away from the delightful cup of coffee to the small ringing bell at her office's front door, a bell she didn't hear too often. There at the door stood three younger kids. They couldn't have been more than 25 years old. Miss Simmons? The young girl questioned. Yes, dear? How can I help you? Rebecca replied. Miss Simmons was an older, gentle-looking woman. She had a look about her that was not only peaceful, but yet oddly tough. She wore a large pair of reading glasses with a light gray knitted sweater and skirt. A golden heart-shaped locket dangled gracefully from her neck. Her silvery hair parted in a respectable fashion. Her office was warm and cluttered with items. Some might even describe it as being cozy. A small heater sat in the corner of the large room which assisted in making the room so delightfully comfortable. Her office had the sweet aroma of freshly brewed coffee. My name's Emily, and these are my friends Mike and Alex. Emily gestured to both of them as she stated their names. It's a pleasure to meet you all, said Rebecca. Emily, Alex, and Mike sat down with Rebecca and told her the details of the past two days, being careful not to place too much negative emphasis on the book. The last thing any of them wanted was for Mike to get up and stampede out of there in a fit of rage. Emily refrained from sharing the details of her dream with everyone, hoping that everything else that was already spoken about during this meeting would warrant Miss Simmons to take action, or at least offer some type of advice. Emily and Alex found comfort in the simple act of confiding in someone who wouldn't dismiss their story as mere fantasy, since Miss Simmons was an expert in the paranormal field. And may I see this book you speak of? Miss Simmons questioned. A heavy feeling fell over Alex and Emily as they slowly turned their glances towards Mike. Mike sat there with a slightly annoyed stare as he held the book in his arms, pressing it tightly against his chest, his eyes jumping all over the area surrounding Miss Simmons and her desk. Miss Simmons glanced at Emily and Alex. She could easily see the terrified look on their faces. However, she knew exactly what was going on. This indeed wasn't her first encounter with a haunted object, nor its newfound owner. Mike, may I see the book? What are you going to do with it? Mike growled. I would love to admire it, and perhaps tell you more about it. Mike sat there in silence, as if critically thinking how this scenario could play out. Miss Simmons slowly opened her desk and retrieved what appeared to be a wicker basket woven of thorns. She carefully lifted the lid and removed a rag that was woven of small metallic fibers. She unfolded the metal cloth out in both of her hands as she slowly extended them towards Mike. Mike's eyes shuddered between the metallic cloth and the thorn woven basket. What is that? Mike said as his eyes locked onto the metallic cloth. Oh, this? It's a special type of cloth. It'll help ensure the book doesn't choose me by accident to become its new owner. Miss Simmons smiled. Mike, who do you think owns this book? I do. It chose me. Emily and Alex both shifted in their seats, with their eyes focused on Miss Simmons, curious on what she would say next. It chose you? Miss Simmons cheerfully questioned him. Yeah, not you, not them. Mike snapped as he gestured to Emily and Alex. Mike, I know you think this book belongs to you, dear, but I'm sorry, it doesn't. 
it truly belongs to someone who is no longer a part of our world. Now, they may wish for you to hold it, to guard it, perhaps, but you can never be the owner if you don't fully understand its power. Mike looked down at the metallic cloth Miss Simmons still draped over her hands. You really want to be the owner, don't you, Mike? Miss Simmons said in a curious tone. Mike placed the book on the metallic cloth and slowly let go. Miss Simmons carefully folded the cloth around the book. The book was both dense and cold, sending chills through the cloth into Miss Simmons' hands. She winced from the discomfort as she placed the item inside the thorny basket and slowly closed the lid. Upon the lid's closure, the air felt immediately lighter for everyone in the room. The heavy burden that both Emily and Alex had been carrying on their shoulders the past two days lightened. Emily began to whimper as a tear of joy fell from her cheek. How are you feeling now, Mike? Miss Simmons questioned. Mike hesitated for a moment, his eyes beginning to water. I... I'm good. He took a deep breath, and his gratitude was evident, his dark eyes wearily glancing towards Miss Simmons, as if trying to say thank you and that he was sorry. Mike, I thought I lost you. Emily cried as she continued to hug Mike. But then an eerie chill descended once more. Miss Simmons watched as Mike's eyes dilated rapidly, his breathing deepening, punctuated by low growls. His expression contorted into one of anger as he stood up violently toppling his chair. He glared at the wicker box on the desk, then at Miss Simmons, clenching his fist and grinding his teeth. With a swift motion, he turned towards the door and stormed out. Mike, no, please, Emily cried, but it was as if he couldn't hear as he slammed the door behind him. Let him go, dear, Miss Simmons urged. Alex questioned Miss Simmons, a slight irritation in his tone. What's going to happen now? The process of phasing down has begun, replied Miss Simmons. Phasing down? What does that mean? Whimpered Emily. It's the process that reverses the possession. There are three phases someone goes through when they become possessed, captured by an evil entity, like the one that is bound to this book. Phase one, or the acquisition phase, occurs when the victim first finds the cursed object and touches it. During phase one, the host, or Mike for example, will be very intrigued and show an abnormal curiosity towards the item. Their typical attitude will change the further along in phase one they get. They become defensive if they feel the slightest threat of being parted with the item. The entity has the power to control emotions and some thoughts. However, the victim still maintains physical control. That is, until phase two begins. What's phase two consist of? Emily quivered as she wiped a tear from her cheek. During phase two, or the partial possession phase. The victim begins to surrender more to the entity, allowing it not to only make some decisions, but also surrenders control of their physical movements. It starts out in small amounts, and usually can be outwardly observed by sporadic twitching of the hands, or short impulsive violent episodes in which the victim lashes out, sometimes causing minor harm to themselves and others, depending on where at in phase two they are. When they cross the threshold from phase two to phase three, however, that is when they become fully possessed. All thoughts, emotions, and actions are in the entity's control at this time. The victim no longer has the ability to fight back, and once fully possessed, the entity will physically break down its host and everyone who loves them. They will do this until their host is near death, and then they will begin to look for a new host oftentimes binding themselves to an item that was loved by the current host. Once the bond with this item is complete, they leave their victim and the victim perishes. And then the phases will begin again for someone new. What phase is Mike in? How do we stop this? Cried Emily. My dear, I cannot say for sure, but from what I've seen, it appears he's somewhere in phase two. Emily began sobbing as she laid her head on Alex's shoulder. Phasing down is what we're doing now. This book acts as a bridge for the entity to reach Mike. By separating the two, it will weaken their bond. 
slowly forcing the entity to starve itself and force it back to the book alone. That's why I told you to let Mike leave. He needed to leave. So what's going to happen to the book now? Questioned Alex. I will keep it and learn from it. Learn from it? What could you possibly learn from this thing? Alex growled. And what's preventing you from becoming possessed? Emily questioned. Miss Simmons glanced at both of them as their questions fought each other to be heard. A sweet yet confident smile formed on her face. This box here is made of hawthorn branches, Miss Simmons said as she gently placed her hand on top of the spike container. Hawthorn wood, although unappealing to hold, creates a great containment vessel. It's been used for centuries to warn off evil spirits. Think of the thorns acting like razor wires that surround a prison. The thin metallic cloth I wrapped the book in was made of iron threads. Iron as well works as a good deterrent. Miss Simmons slowly got up from her seat and gestured for Emily and Alex to follow her. She led the pair down a dimly lit hallway, the mood slowly dampening with each and every step they took. She stopped just in front of a small door that was decorated with wrought iron bars. She opened the door and they all stepped inside. Standing there in disbelief, Emily and Alex were overcome by pure fear. The room was a chilling sight to behold. Shelves lined every wall, stretching from floor to ceiling. And upon these shelves were hundreds of similar small hawthorn branch boxes. The boxes set in orderly rows, their thorny exteriors gleaming ominously in the dimly lit room. It was an archive of darkness, a testament to the encounters that Miss Simmons had faced over the years. Why do you keep these items, Miss Simmons? Emily inquired, her voice tinged with a mix of apprehension and fascination. In a controlled setting, I communicate with these entities to understand their stories, their fears, and sometimes their motivations. Many of these spirits are just as afraid of the living as the living are of them. They are lost, confused, and bound to this realm without even understanding why. Over time, I help them understand that they need to let go, to pass on to the afterlife, to stop dwelling here with the living. Emily was captivated by Miss Simmons' explanation. So, when these spirits accept that they need to move on, what happens? A faint smile played on Miss Simmons' lips as she continued. Once the spirit accepts that they need to move on, they simply vanish. The surrounding darkness and negative energy that once consumed the space begins to dissipate. The object itself returns back to room temperature and is no longer frigid and cold. And what do you do with the object once the spirits moved on? I burn them, she said in a cold and serious tone. Burning the item breaks the bond completely and ensures that the entity doesn't return. It's the only way to free them from their earthly ties. It allows them to find peace in the afterlife, or so I hope. Alex couldn't help but express his frustration, his voice taking on an aggravated tone. Why not just burn the item right away and skip the small talk? What if something goes wrong? Miss Simmons regarded Alex with a patient and understanding expression. I understand your concern, Alex, but while burning the item immediately might seem like the most straightforward solution, it isn't always that simple. Some of these entities are trapped, tormented souls. They need a chance to communicate, to understand and accept their situation before they can move on peacefully. If I simply burn the item without giving the spirit the chance to find peace, the spirit could possibly be cast into the deepest depths of hell, where it would suffer for all eternity. My work isn't just about safeguarding the living from the paranormal, but also about extending compassion to the souls who have become lost in the shadows. It's a delicate balance between protection and redemption. Okay, what if the spirit isn't peaceful? What if they enjoy causing harm? Then what? interrupted Alex. Alex's question hung heavy in the air, and Miss Simmons didn't respond immediately. She appeared conflicted, as if grappling with the emotions tied to her work. Finally, she spoke, her voice tinged with sadness. 
In the rarest of cases, Alex, when a spirit is not peaceful and seems to revel in causing harm, I have no choice but to proceed directly to burning the item. It's a decision I don't take lightly, she admitted, her words weighed down by the gravity of such actions. Miss Simmons continued, There are entities out there beyond redemption, consumed by malevolence. But be warned, Alex, it isn't just the spirits that face uncertain fates. The living person's soul who they are bound to may share the same fate, although there isn't any certain way of knowing. Emily and Alex exchanged a knowing look, their concern for Mike deepening. Alex's eyes shifted from Emily's and fixed on a spot just beyond her shoulder. What about that? Alex said sternly as he pointed just past Emily's left shoulder. Emily, curious about his sudden alarm, turned around to see what captured Alex's attention. She felt her heart sink deep into her stomach. Her eyes widened as her gaze fell upon the golden dagger. It was the very same dagger that had haunted her dreams, the one she had seen in Mike's possession, her hands grasping her wrists that were still irritated. Miss Simmons, puzzled by their sudden focus on the weapon, regarded it for a moment before responding. Her tone held a hint of protectiveness as she replied, That was a gift from an old friend. Alex, please stop, Emily pleaded, her words laced with worry. But Alex was resolute and refused to halt his relentless stride. I'm through with this, Emily. I'm done. I just want to be left alone. He continued to walk briskly along the sidewalk of the empty street, his path dimly lit by the moon and the occasional flickering streetlight. Emily, her heart heavy, called out to him once more, her voice quivering with emotion. Alex, please but her cries fell on deaf ears as Alex remained silent, his determination unwavering. It wasn't until Emily managed to catch up to him, her hand gripping his wrist, that he stopped abruptly. He winced in pain as she grasped him firmly, her fingers landing on faint burn marks that still marred his skin from the previous night's nightmare. She could see the agony in his eyes, and he yelled in frustration. Stop it, Emily! You have no idea! Emily stood there in silence for a brief moment and then slowly raised her arm, pulling down her own sleeve to reveal similar burn marks on her wrist. I do know, she whispered, her words filled with understanding and empathy. Alex's eyes widened with horror as his glance shifted from her wrist back up to her eyes. A violent gasp of air tore from Alex's trembling lips as he screamed out in absolute terror his voice echoing along the empty street. Emily, her own heart pounding with dread, pulled him in aggressively, determined to fight through his overwhelming emotions. He was terrified and sobbing uncontrollably, his body trembling in her tight embrace as they clung to each other in the midst of their shared nightmare. Emily cried out hysterically, her sobs intensifying as she spoke out and relived the nightmare with Alex. Her voice trembled with emotion as she recounted the terrifying ordeal, sharing every haunting detail. And the very moment you died, I felt a part of me die as well. The pain in her voice was palpable, a true testament to the deep bond they shared. They stood there silently and held each other, Alex grasping the back of Emily's head as he cradled her up to his chest. The clock ticked loudly on the wall, each second reverberating through the dimly lit space. Outside, the storm raged on, its distant rumbling punctuating the atmosphere with a sense of unease. A soft flickering glow from the overhead lights cast long shadows, creating an ambiance of isolation and melancholy. Amid this gloomy setting, a little boy sat with a group of children at a nearby table their hushed voices carrying across the room. They glanced over their shoulders at Rebecca, who remained seated at her own table, engrossed in her drawing. Her small fingers gently sketched a picture of a butterfly perched on a vibrant flower. Amidst their hushed conversation, she caught a fragment of one kid's jokes. 
I heard she killed her parents. Laughter rippled through the group of children as another voice chimed in. I heard she's a witch. That's why her parents gave her away. The cruel remarks pierced Rebecca's heart, and she felt a deep sadness welling up inside. She continued to draw, trying to block out the hurtful words. I really wish I knew what happened, she thought to herself, her eyes fixed on the colorful butterfly she was creating. Rebecca Simmons had been at Pineville Orphanage for three long years to date, yet she had never managed to make a single friend. It was a difficult and painful experience being eight years old, alone, and in this orphanage. She vaguely remembered her mother and father. As a matter of fact, the only ounce of proof she possessed showing that they truly had a family at one time was a small golden heart-shaped locket that she wore around her neck. When the locket was open, it would display a small black and white faded photograph in which all three of them stood together in. Her father had clasped it around her neck on the night he dropped her off at the orphanage's front door. She was just too young at the time to remember any of it fully. She could, however, remember her father's warmth and love, and that was the only comfort she had in this lonely place. The group of kids' laughter across the room erupted again. Why did they get rid of me? Her thoughts cried out. The joyous laughter of children gradually subsided as she slowly closed her eyes. A recognizable woman's voice called out to her. Rebecca, did you hear me? The woman chuckled. Yes? Rebecca replied as she slowly opened her eyes. I said happy birthday, her voice brimming with warmth. Rebecca slowly nodded her head, accompanied by a small yet earnest smile. The day that Rebecca had longed for had finally arrived. At the age of 18, she was now legally emancipated free to leave the confines of Pineville's children's home. Rebecca sat across the desk from the orphanage director, the room bathed in the soft morning light. Behind the director's desk stood rows of filing cabinets, most likely containing all the children's personal files. Placed with a sense of reverence before the director was an old, worn envelope. Rebecca? The director's voice quivered with emotion. We've never really spoken about the night you first arrived here. She paused as she got teary-eyed. On that night, I was sitting in my chair in the common room reading. All the children were asleep. I heard a loud knock at the door. It was a late December evening and extremely cold outside. She added, I opened the front door to find you standing there on the porch alone. You had your bag sitting next to you on the ground. She paused again as she took a sip from her tea. However, it was clear to Rebecca that the tea break was just an excuse to distract her from crying. You had an envelope pinned to your coat. Inside the envelope was a large amount of money and instructions. The instructions were addressed from a man who called himself James, and he identified himself as your father. He explained that he hoped that the money wouldn't help only accommodate your stay here, but the other kids as well. We were very poor at the time. We didn't have enough money to keep the place heated. But in the letter that was pinned to your coat, your father asked us to inform you on the day you turned 18. Today, for you to go to the First Bank of Pineville, there you will find a safety deposit box under your name, Rebecca Simmons. I don't know what to expect you'll find there, but good luck. I'll miss you, Rebecca. The woman's cries filled the room as they slowly faded away. Within the bank's secure vault, a frigid chill hung in the air, where row upon row of safety deposit boxes lined the walls. Rebecca stood there in the dimly lit room, her eyes fixated on the table before her. Her deposit box sat there open, revealing its contents. Nestled inside was an unusual small thorn-ridden basket in a letter. Rebecca reached out for the letter and delicately unfolded the parchment and read, Rebecca, my dear, I am profoundly sorry that life has led us down this challenging path. You were my everything, and that truth remains unwavering. I made difficult choices to shield you from harm. Both your mother and I hold a deep, abiding love for you. Sadly, 
your mother Sarah is unwell now, and her time may be limited. I'm reluctant to subject you to the heartache that lies ahead. Fate has dealt us a cruel hand, veering us away from the family we were meant to be. I had envisioned watching you grow into a young woman. Our lives intertwined as my hair turned gray and time marched on. But we mustn't dwell on what could or should have been in life. Please take the item within this basket and sell it at the market. It should fetch you a reasonable sum of money, which will serve you as a starting point financially in this unforgiving world. While I hold little hopes that our paths shall ever cross again in this lifetime, I eagerly anticipate our meeting in the next. Sincerely, your father, James Ashton. She sat down the letter and peered at the basket. As she lifted the lid, a pervasive coldness settled upon the entire room, casting down a heavy weight. There before her sat a single golden dagger, its smooth blade gleaming under the vault's subdued lighting. Its handle, a masterpiece in itself, appeared to be meticulously carved from ivory. Secured within its intricate design were small crimson rubies. With cautious anticipation, Rebecca extended her hand to retrieve the dagger. Yet as her fingers made contact with its chilling surface, an intense shiver coursed throughout her entire body. A low groan escaped Rebecca's lips as she felt the numbness spread throughout her hand. The dagger fell from her grips and she gently massaged her palm, patiently awaiting the return of feeling to her fingertips. With caution, she positioned the thorn-covered lid back into its original place, picked up the basket, and walked out of the room. The relentless winter storm was erupting outside as the wind hurled snow against the window pane. The soft, lingering aroma of coffee still present in the air, presenting itself as evidence of her earlier intentions to work late. Rebecca looked up at the clock on the wall and saw that it displayed midnight. Well, old gal, looks like you've gone and done it again. Huh, fell asleep right at your desk, didn't you? Her voice carried a tone of playful self-mockery. With a bemused grin, her eyes shifted from the clock on the wall to the thorn-covered basket containing the cursed book that was sitting on her desk. Her grin soon faded, and she couldn't help but think about the children whom she met earlier. The thought that these children had actually stumbled across her old childhood home startled her. She carefully removed the basket's lid and took out the book. Gripping a pair of small iron tweezers, one in each hand, being cautious not to touch the haunted item herself, she opened the book. Coldness radiated from the item as she read the spiritual contract located on the first page. Seeing the signature of her mother, Sarah Ashton, painted in blood at the bottom was heart-wrenching. However, the first page alone revealed that Rebecca, at a young age, had fallen deathly ill. It appeared that her poor mother's last resort was to sacrifice her own soul to save her daughter. With just one page, so many childhood questions were answered. She sat there for a moment as she thought back to all those times she had silently cursed her parents' names as she grew up, believing she had been abandoned, betrayed, and forgotten. Upon turning the first page, she immediately noticed a striking transformation in her mother's writing style. The once graceful, swirling curse of characters had given way to jagged, violent scratches that marred the page. The book unfolded its dark secrets across several chapters, each delving deeper into the unsettling concept of self-sacrifice. It meticulously detailed the required supplies and steps to accomplish an act, the book itself referred to as Ritus Finalis. While skimming through the book's pages, she stumbled upon one that had been conspicuously removed. Squinting through her oversized reading glasses, she discerned that it had been torn out, leaving a void in the narrative. Suddenly, the office's lights dimmed and the front doorbell chimed, its delicate jingle signaling the entrance of an unseen visitor. 
The only source of illumination was a solitary candle, flickering light on her cluttered desk. She raised her gaze, perplexed that no one was present. Perhaps it's just the wind, she muttered out loud, though her racing heart contradicted the dismissive thought. The room had grown so frigid now that each exhale materialized in a frosty plume before her eyes. In the shadowy corner near the door, a spectral figure emerged, its transparency adding an eerie dimension to its presence. An otherworldly icy whisper echoed through the room. Rebecca. As the entity uttered her name, an icy gust assailed her face, causing the hair on the back of her neck to stand on end and goosebumps to ripple across her skin. Mother? Rebecca questioned wearily, her voice tinged with disbelief. The apparition began a slow, deliberate advance. Utter disbelief and panic overcame Rebecca as her trembling hand shot to the desk. She quickly grabbed the cursed book, a shock of coldness erupting in her arm. The pain was agonizing, as if she had submerged her hand into a bucket of ice water. Clenching her teeth in pain, she slammed the book down in the thorn-covered basket with a resounding thud. Her eyes tore from the basket to the room, and her heart sank as she realized that the entity still lingered. But how is she still here? The book is safely contained in the Hawthorne basket, she frantically pondered. In an instant, searing pain exploded at the back of her head, sending her sprawling to the floor. Struggling to focus, she gazed up at her assailant, and there stood Mike. Towering above her, he slowly withdrew a tiny slip of paper from his pocket. She glanced at the apparition as it moved towards both of them, and with that, the room plunged into darkness. The soft morning light spread throughout Emily's room as she awoke. She fumbled beneath the covers searching for her phone, which she had inadvertently fallen asleep with the night before. With a soft sigh of relief, she located it and unlocked the screen, revealing an unread text message from Alex. It was a brief yet assuring note that he made it home safely. A fond smile tugged at her lips as she reminisced about how their true feelings had finally surfaced the night before. Who would have imagined it would take such a dreadful situation for us to gather the courage to share our feelings? She cheerfully said. Yet, her joyful thoughts about their blossoming relationship gradually gave way to her concern for Mike. I wonder how he's doing, she pondered. It pained her deeply to witness her friend's ongoing struggle. But still, Emily held on to hope, trusting in Miss Simmons' words that in the coming days, Mike would return to his usual self. Sitting up in bed, she stretched her arms dramatically, her back arching in the process, as she let out a hearty yawn that signaled the official start of her day. Emily walked down the hallway from her room to the kitchen. She placed her phone down on the counter as she began to scoop coffee grounds into the coffee maker. Her phone began to ring, and she curiously leaned over to glance to see who it was. A smile ignited on her face as she saw Alex's name on the screen. She finished preparing the coffee and hit the start button as she turned to retrieve her phone. On the line, she could hear Alex's voice quivering. Where are you? I'm at my apartment. Where are you? Emily replied. Something happened, Alex said, his tone anxious and in disbelief. What is it? Is everything... Before she could finish her sentence, Alex interjected. There's police lined up all down the street in front of Miss Simmons' office. It, it looks bad. Real bad. Emily's heart began to flutter as she tried to catch her breath. I'll be there shortly. The street was lined with police cars to deter traffic and ensure the scene was secure. The occasional radio police chatter could be heard from the other side of the street where Emily and Alex stood. From the sidewalk, they could see that the front windows of Miss Simmons' office were shattered. Police had already isolated the crime scene with cones and scene tape. What are the odds Mike has something to do with this? Questioned Emily. Alex remained silent, his head shaking in disbelief as he analyzed the situation. 
It was as if he hadn't even heard Emily speak. Alex? With a deep sigh, Alex responded. Of course this involves Mike. To think otherwise would be naive, Emily. Determined, Emily started walking toward one of the officers. Excuse me, officer. Emily spoke up. The officer, a burly man with broad shoulders, turned to Emily as she approached. What can I do for you, ma'am? He asked abruptly. I hate to bother you, but I was wondering if you could tell me what happened here. Emily questioned. Sorry, young lady, I can't. The scene's still under investigation, the officer replied. Emily glanced behind him, getting a closer look at the building. I understand, she said as her head lowered. I'm sorry to have bothered you. It's just I'm trying so hard to get into journalism. I was just hoping I could get some information so I could present it to the Pineville Bugle. I'm trying to build up my resume, but, you know, in a small town like this, you don't often see something like this, she said as a single tear rolled down her cheek. Alex sat there silently, thoroughly impressed as he watched the entire conversation unfold before him. The officer noticed the young girl becoming quite emotional. He paused for a moment, readjusting his duty belt. <sighs> Listen, I can't go into specifics, but it looks like the place was robbed. We don't have any suspects yet and we're still trying to look for the woman who owns the office. There seems to be some type of struggle that took place, but we'll know more when our forensic specialist arrives to run DNA test. Oh my. Emily gasped. That's so sad. Well, thank you, officer. Seriously, you've helped me out so much here. Maybe I can get the job after all. Emily nervously giggled as the officer turned to walk back to the office. Wow. Emily, that was quick thinking. I can't believe that worked. Great job on the tier. You really sold it. Well, thank you. She blushed as she continued. So we know someone did get hurt because forensics is coming to run samples of something. They haven't located a body, right? Because he said that they're still trying to contact the owner, Miss Simmons. Alex nodded. Yeah, you're right. So, what now? Emily questioned. We need to talk to Mike. Alex answered, his tone both determined and nervous. Emily held the phone to her ear as it continued to ring, eventually leading to Mike's voicemail. Any luck? Alex questioned as they walked down the sidewalk towards Mike's house. No, Emily replied, still going to voicemail. The two of them began to quicken their pace as they rounded the corner and spotted Mike's building. As they approached, they could clearly see that the place was empty through the dark windows. They walked up the front porch, and once they reached the door, Alex began banging on it. They sat there in silence, both glancing through the windows to see if they could spot Mike or Miss Simmons. As Alex began banging again, he was cut off by Emily speaking. It's no use, Alex. He isn't here, Emily sadly said, as she pointed down at a small package leaning against the front door on the outside. They delivered this package yesterday afternoon. He would have grabbed it last night when he got home. Alex's eyes shifted to the small package, acknowledging that Emily was right. Well, now what? Alex exclaimed, his voice filled with annoyance and defeat. Emily's eyes widened as her hand shot down to her jacket pockets to retrieve her phone. I forgot. Mike and I have location sharing enabled on our phones. I should be able to see where he is. She excitedly exclaimed. Alex took a deep breath, sighing with relief, as he watched Emily tap on her phone screen. Emily sat there in silence as her face began to turn pale white, her excited smile fading. What's wrong? Alex said with concern. Emily handed the phone to Alex without saying a word. As Alex's eyes slowly scanned the map, he located Mike's small icon, ominously situated in the mountains outside of town. He went back to the Ashton estate, Alex wearily said. Why would he go back? He paused and turned to Emily. Do you think he dropped his phone out there? Considering the thought, Emily leaned over and tapped on Mike's icon, revealing that Mike had been at the spot for less than two hours. A heavy feeling descended upon Emily as she shared her findings with Alex. Let's just go to the cops. That's the only logical thing to do here, right? Emily shook her head in disagreement. No, we can't do that. 
Why not? Alex rebuted. In a sarcastically delightful tone, Emily exclaimed, Oh, hey, Mr. Officer. Remember me? Yeah, the girl who just lied to you about going into journalism. So it turns out we were actually at Miss Simmons' office last night with our friend Mike. But unfortunately, our friend Mike is possessed by a demon book. Oh, that we actually stole from a house out in the mountains. But anyways, do you think once your forensics team gets finished mopping up this crime scene, you all can help us go retrieve our friend and his hostage in the mountains? No? Didn't think so. Alex glanced into the distance without replying, knowing all too well that Emily was right. Going to the cops now would ultimately hold them responsible for any and all crimes committed, including whatever happened to Rebecca Simmons. They exchanged wordless glances, their facial expressions alone conveying what they were about to have to do. They were going to the old Ashton estate. The drive took several hours, and the hike was excruciating as the winter storm moved into the area. Heavy snow obscured their vision as they tried to retrace their steps back to the cabin in the woods. A depressed feeling overcame both Emily and Alex as they stood on the hill overlooking the Ashton estate. To think that the last time that they were there, all three of them were together and excited to explore. But now, it was just Emily and Alex, both of them wishing that they had never decided to go to the house in the first place. Well, we made it. Are you sure this is gonna work, Alex? Emily questioned. I don't know him, but we don't have many other options. Alex said as his eyes scanned the house's windows, looking for any visible signs of Mike or Miss Simmons. The pair eventually made their way down the small snow embankment and then up to the front porch. Alex grasped the house's cold front doorknob and on contact his heart began to instantly race. Taking a deep breath, he glanced back at Emily. He was easily able to see the fear that bestowed upon her face. He removed his hand from the door and turned back to her pulling her into him for one last hug. Whatever happens, Emily, just stick to the plan. We need to move as quickly and as silently as possible. Emily met his gaze and nodded, her eyes reflecting a mix of determination and trepidation. A silent affirmation that she understood the gravity of what all was at stake. The front door's hinges groaned as it sent echoes throughout the house as Alex slowly opened it. Before taking a step in, he cautiously scanned the room with his flashlight, its beam cutting through the darkness. The fireplace located in the common area that once served as a source of warmth during their previous visit now lay cold and dark. Alex and Emily began to advance into the house, each of their steps being answered by the creaking wooden floorboards. Alex proceeded to a nearby coat closet, heaving his backpack off his shoulders and resting it on the floor. Kneeling down, he began hastily searching through his pack. Meanwhile, Emily traversed the room, gathering a motley assortment of items. She collected the old sheets covering the furniture, as well as the couch cushions themselves, and began piling them on the floor next to Alex. As Emily searched the room, her eyes caught a shimmer of a small metallic object lying on the floor, just at the opening of the hallway that led to the stairs. With a delicate touch, Emily picked up the object, revealing it to be a small golden heart-shaped locket. Alex glanced up from his backpack to see Emily standing there. What is it? He asked in a frantic whisper. Emily examined the locket closely, her fingers tracing its contours. It's Miss Simmons' necklace, she replied, her voice quivering slightly. I saw her wearing it when we went to her office. It's definitely hers. Upon closer inspection, Emily noticed that the locket's clasp had been damaged, causing it to be partially open. Gently, she pried it open completely, revealing an all-too-familiar photograph of a young girl with her parents. Emily's eyes widened with the realization that this was the same photograph that hung prominently in the house at the end of the hall. Sensing Emily's distress, Alex spoke up. What's wrong? Not saying a word, Emily quickly walked to Alex and knelt down by his side, and slowly displayed the locket containing the picture. Recognition dawned on his face as he realized the significance of the image. 
the eerie connection between Miss Simmons, the locket, and this house left them both with an unsettling feeling. Alex rested his hand on Emily's shoulder and offered a gentle reminder. Emily, stick to the plan. Emily nodded in acknowledgement as she went about her task. Glancing back down, Alex retrieved the small portable kerosene cooktop and iron skillet from his backpack. Placing the skillet atop the burner, he positioned both items in the corner of the closet. With a swift motion, he reached back into his bag, this time pulling out his first aid kit. After opening its lid, he extracted a small travel-sized bottle of rubbing alcohol. Emily remained silent, her eyes fixed on Alex as he unscrewed the bottle's cap and carefully poured the liquid into the skillet. They both proceeded to take all the items that Emily had piled up and began placing them in the closet at the opposite corner from the cooktop. Suddenly, from somewhere down the hall, they began to hear two faint voices accompanied by approaching footsteps. Reacting swiftly, Alex stood up, gently pulling Emily behind him to shield her from view as the unknown voices drew nearer. All at once, an unexpected chill descended upon the room. The air was freezing, so intense that Alex's breath became visible with each exhalation. Sarah, please, the man begged as he followed the woman. I've already made my mind up, James, Sarah replied sternly. There has to be another way. This isn't right, Sarah, James argued, his voice filled with desperation. However, Sarah paid no heed to his demands, instead pretending to inspect the fireplace mantle for dust. As she stroked her finger along the surface, she began to examine as if the dust were more important than anything James had to say. Alex's eyes widened in horror, and he stumbled backward until there was no further room to retreat. Sarah and James continued to argue, while Emily and Alex remained silent and still. The longer Alex observed them, the clearer it became that their bodies were translucent. Sarah, you'll be damning your soul for eternity! Not for all eternity, James. Only while she's living, Sarah replied. James stood there for a moment, then he turned to pace the room, rubbing his chin in contemplation. He passed within feet of Emily and Alex, still oblivious to their presence. Sarah, we can seek help from another doctor. There must be another way. Sarah sat down, her eyes welling up with tears. James, my baby girl is sick. Our baby girl is suffering. She won't make it to the end of the week. Call them crazy cultists, satanists, whatever you want. Because they are, Sarah, James interrupted. But they've promised me this will work. They, they've helped me more than anyone else has, Sarah said, wiping a tear from her cheek as she began walking toward the hallway. James remained there alone for a moment before slowly fading out of sight. What the hell was that? Alex questioned, his eyes scanning the room. Were they ghosts? No, I don't think so. It seemed like a memory playing out right in front of us, Emily curiously replied. The pair turned their attention back to the closet. Alex bent down, ignited the small burner, and quietly closed the door. No turning back now, Alex grimly said, as they both started walking toward the hallway. The anticipation of what lay ahead weighed heavily on their minds. Once they made it halfway through the corridor, another apparition appeared. Alex stopped dead in his tracks, his arms flying up in a defensive posture. This time, a man in a crimson robe stood in the hallway, just outside an open door. Just like the last time, the ghostly figure seemed to not notice Emily and Alex. Just inside the room that the cloaked figure was standing outside of, the two familiar voices of James and Sarah could be heard again. My precious baby, mommy will always love you, Rebecca, Sarah gently said. A child's sickly cough and wheeze occasionally emanated from the room. Miss Ashton, the cloaked figure spoke in a low growling tone. We are ready upstairs. Please, Sarah, please don't. James Ashton's voice faintly said. Alex and Emily cautiously moved closer, attempting to catch a glimpse inside the room. But all at once, the voices and cloak figure vanished into thin air, leaving the pair once again 
alone in the darkened corridor. With a heavy sigh, Alex and Emily pressed forward, passing the family's portrait still hanging on the wall as they slowly began making their way up the stairs. The wooden steps creaked softly under their weight, and the air continued to grow cooler and thicker with each and every step. They reached the top of the large staircase and found themselves once again looking at the attic's door. As they approached the door, Emily placed a gentle hand on Alex's shoulder, silently urging him to be cautious. They both listened intently, straining their ears to catch any sound that might offer a clue of Mike or Miss Simmons' whereabouts. Then, as if carried on the very air itself, they heard it. A muffled shuffling sound coming from the other side of the attic door. It was accompanied by soft sporadic whimpers, symbolizing someone in pain. Something was undeniably wrong, and they couldn't afford to waste any more time. Gently, they pushed open the attic door, its hinges protesting with a low, eerie groan. As they swept their flashlights across the room, their hearts nearly stopped as they heard the faint, weak whimpers of what sounded like a woman in distress. The source of the sound became clear as their light settled on a figure huddled near the sinister mirror. It was Miss Simmons, her once vibrant eyes now filled with terror and pain. She was bound by old, frayed rope, her hands and feet immobilized, her clothing torn and disheveled. Miss Simmons! Emily cried out as she began to run to her aid. But before she could reach her, Alex grabbed Emily by the arm and pulled her back. Wait! Alex yelled with a mix of fear and caution. Suddenly, from out of nowhere, crimson robed figures appeared. They stood in two lines, one on each side of the room leading to the mirror. There between the two lines, Sarah Ashton sat on the ground, and in front of her, the haunted book. Behind Sarah stood the cloaked figure from the hallway, recognizable by his low growling voice. Off to the side stood James Ashton. He was pale and obviously uncomfortable with everything that was about to happen. Emily and Alex's attention shifted from Mr. Ashton to the cloaked figure standing behind Sarah as he began to speak. Sarah, he intoned, his words hollow and cold. It is time to formalize our accord. Sarah let out a frantic whimper as her eyes fell upon the contract laid out before her, etched meticulously on the book's first page. Fear clung to her like a second skin, but her desperation to save her beloved daughter outweighed all else. In this grim exchange, it was simple. Her daughter's fragile life would be exchanged for Sarah's very soul. For every year that her daughter continued to live, the malevolent entity would damn Sarah's soul. With a shallow breath, Sarah nodded, her determination battling against her dread. The cloaked figure presented the golden dagger, gently placing it into her trembling hand. Sarah winced in pain as she carefully slid the long blade against her fingertip as a small trail of dark crimson blood began to pour out. With a quivering hand, Sarah slowly lowered her fingertip to the contract spread out before her its parchment-like surface eager to soak up her offering. Sarah's anguished cry echoed through the room as she completed her signature at the bottom of the page. With the final stroke of her finger, her head dropped forward and she fell into a chilling silence. Emily and Alex watched in horror, their eyes wide with disbelief, as Sarah's head shot up abruptly. Her once vibrant eyes were now empty black voids. With an unnatural fluidity, she reached down and grabbed a pen that lay on the floor nearby. Her hand moved with an eerie precision as she began to write in the accursed book. Her head whipped violently from side to side, her hair thrashing about as if caught in a storm. She breathed heavily, punctuating her actions with unsettling, thunderous laughter that seemed to emanate from the depths of despair. Her pen strokes were furious and frenzied, the pages of the journal turning rapidly, as if guided by an unseen force. The cloaked figure behind her glanced down at the book and began repeating everything she wrote. The other cloaked figures in the room echoed his chilling words, their voices creating a haunting chorus. Sarah's laughter, already haunting, 
descended into an even deeper and more unnatural register. Her movements grew increasingly violent, her body contorting, as if in the grip of some malevolent force. She turned to the last page, and with the final stroke of her pen, her entire body suddenly went limp, collapsing onto the cold, unforgiving floor. It seemed as though her life had been drained by the unholy act that she had just performed. It has been done, the cloaked figure called out triumphantly as he raised his arms in the air. Sarah! James Ashton's anguish cry pierced the chilling air as he rushed to her lifeless body lying on the ground. He dropped down to his knees, cradling his beloved wife's head in his trembling hands. Leaning down, he pressed a sorrowful kiss to her pale forehead, his tears falling like rain as he wept in profound grief. James sat there for a moment, his heart heavy with loss, as the echoes of the sinister ritual continued to reverberate around him. His eyes darted around the dimly lit room, taking in the eerie sight of the cloaked figures and the malevolent presence that hung in the air. The cloaked figure behind him stood tall, his deep, otherworldly laughter resonating like a haunting melody that shook the very foundations of the attic. James Ashton, his face etched with a mixture of sorrow and determination, gently lowered his wife's lifeless head to the floor. With trembling hands, he retrieved the golden dagger that lay nearby. In a swift, determined motion, he pivoted from the floor and thrusted the dagger upward, piercing the towering cloaked man's chest. A deafening roar echoed through the attic, and the remaining cloaked figures that lined the room vanished into thin air. You will be damned, the man roared, his voice filled with malevolence, before he too disappeared from sight, leaving James Ashton standing there alone. I've got to get Rebecca out of here, he screamed aloud to himself. And with that, he sprinted towards the door, and his translucent form faded away completely. Miss Simmons' cries filled the attic as she apologized to the children. Children, I'm sorry. I just wanted to know what happened to my parents. As Emily and Alex knelt down to release Miss Simmons from her restraints, Alex noticed that both the cursed book and the golden dagger still lay there. Where's Mike? Alex exclaimed, his voice fraught with concern. Before Miss Simmons could respond, a brutal force struck the back of Alex's head, causing him to crash to the floor. Emily screamed as Mike leapt on top of Alex, and the two of them began to grapple violently, their bodies rolling across the attic's dusty floor. Mike's eyes had turned an abyssal black, and his deep guttural breaths reverberated ominously through the attic. He started shouting in a language that sounded like Latin, his fingers wrapped with an unnatural strength around Alex's throat. Alex gasped for air, his hands desperately clawing at Mike's iron grip. Suddenly, a deafening explosion rocked the space, erupting from somewhere below. The attic's foundation shifted and sagged. Fire and smoke billowed out of a collapsed portion of the floor revealing the blazing inferno unleashed by Emily and Alex's primitive timed incendiary device. Smoke descended from the attic ceiling as the flames continued to surge higher through the gaping hole. Emily, tears streaming down her face, threw herself around Mike's neck, exerting all her strength to subdue him and make him release Alex. She strained and fought in every ounce of her being, but it seemed hopeless. Mike was determined to kill Alex, and there was little Emily could do. In her desperation, she cried out to Miss Simmons, her voice a plea for assistance. Miss Simmons, who had slowly risen to her feet, stood there blankly as she watched the struggle. Her gaze fell upon the cursed book and the sinister dagger, both still resting on the attic floor. With a resolute but pained determination, she picked up both items with trembling hands feeling an icy, numbing sensation course through her. Ignoring the pain, she staggered over to the edge of the gaping hole, flames licking out from below. With a final, agonized scream, she hurled herself and the accursed objects into the fiery abyss. Emily's screams echoed through the attic as she witnessed Miss Simmons fall to her certain death. She held onto Mike 
and they both fell over to the floor as Mike's body went limp. As Mike's hands released their death grip from Alex's throat, Alex gasped for precious air, his hands trembling as they instinctively went to his bruised throat. Emily, her fear and urgency intensifying, quickly got to her feet and rushed over to Alex's side. Please, Alex, get up. We need to get out of here now. Her voice trembled with anxiety as she begged him to move. Alex, still recovering from the brutal attack, struggled to lift himself from the floor. He coughed, the smoke rapidly engulfing the room and distorting their vision. With every ounce of strength, he began to crawl towards Mike's motionless form. Emily joined in the effort, and together they managed to drag Mike's limp body out of the attic, their hearts pounding in their chest as they raced toward the front door. Emily and Alex stood on the snow-covered embankment as they watched the ominous glow of the burning Ashton estate cast eerie shadows on the landscape. Emily and Alex couldn't tear their eyes away from the fiery spectacle. The once grand house was now being devoured by the fire. Its structural members, weakened by the flames, surrendered with thundering cracks that echoed through the snow-covered valley. What happened? Mike's voice was weak, his memory clouded by the events of the attic. Emily and Alex exchanged a somber glance before Emily gently responded. You don't remember? Mike sat there, momentarily confused and silent, until his eyes locked onto the house engulfed in flames. We were supposed to stay there tonight. What, what happened? Mike, we were supposed to stay here three days ago, but... Emily began to speak, but was interrupted by Alex's gentle hand patting her on the shoulder. Let's give him some time, Alex said in a caring tone. They helped Mike off the snowy ground as he let out a soft groan. As he slowly rose to a standing position, he couldn't believe his eyes. Who is that? He wearily questioned. As Alex and Emily's gaze shifted toward the house, off in the distance, standing in front of the home engulfed in flames, were three transparent individuals, a mother, father, and their little daughter. The father wrapped both arms around the two girls, as if taking a deep breath and sighing with relief. He looked toward Emily and Alex, and in a silent gesture of gratitude, he nodded his head gently. The little girl, wearing a small heart-shaped locket around her neck, smiled and winked at them. With a delicate motion, she raised her petite hand and offered a farewell wave, her smile glowing with innocence and warmth as they all three faded out of sight.